Everyone, thanks so much for uh, logging on to our webinar. This is our, actually our fourth one uh, that uh, we um, are doing. Um, and uh, we're really excited to continue to inform you in, in these changing times. Um, so to give you some background, uh, my name's Alex Wilson. I've, uh, I'm a real estate agent and own Remax uh, Wealth Builders Real Estate. To the left of me here, I have Cal DeVigi, uh, Director of Operations for Remax Wealth Builders Real Estate, uh, also an investment specialist uh, with the team. Uh, and then we have Elaine Page, um, our favorite guest. Uh, she is an award-winning paralegal, um, was awarded uh, Paralegal of the Year by the Ontario Law Society in 2013. She's been in this business for, is it 25 plus years or 20 plus years? 25 plus. 25 plus years. So has really seen it all and, and we've been having great conversations around um, landlords and, and how to deal in this time with the landlord and tenant board, uh, suspending evictions uh, in um, rental properties. Um, so I'll make this clear right off the bat, because um, we'll get lots of questions about this th throughout uh, the webinar and um, I'll detail in a second about the, uh, the protocol for questions wise. Evictions at the landlord and tenant board have been suspended which means you cannot evict someone currently for non-payment of rent and you cannot evict someone for owner occupying a unit so that's where we currently stand right now now we're going to dive into what all that means and talk more about that but the landlord and tenant board is not serving evictions for those two purposes and have also um, any evictions that were ordered for these items are currently not uh, being enforced either. So there are no evictions right now. Um, there is one type of eviction, um, which I can probably guarantee that no one on this call uh, will, it'll be applicable for, but I'll let Elaine talk about that when we get into talking about uh, different stories and everything. Um, so I'll give you an idea of my, uh, my background why. So from an investment standpoint, I'm, a, I'm also a landlord. I have 14 condos. I own a triplex in High Park and I have an apartment building in Hamilton. So I have a wide range of properties. Um, so just like you, uh, people that have signed on here, um, April 1st was a concern for me coming up and is, are my rents going to come in? How is that going to work? Now, um, for the most, I shouldn't say for the most part, all of my rents came in, so that was great. Uh, I also own a property management company as well. And uh, we had a lot of questions from our landlords and for the most part, all of April 1st rents came in. Some of them came in a little slower. There were conversations that we had to have with tenants wise, but overall uh, April 1st wasn't as bad as it, as, as it was potentially seen to be in the media wise. And Elaine and I talked uh, last week about this. The, the typical uh, rental capture rate is 90 to 95%, somewhere around there, right Elaine? On a, on yeah. a month. And I think it, it ended up at 85 to 87% that people paid their rent um, roughly for April 1st? Roughly. We don't really know for sure because the, the way they're calculating it is through the big landlords and not mm -hmm. the smaller landlords, but yeah. basically, yes. So, so, so yeah. So, I, I, so overall, it, uh, April 1st wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, doomsday. Now, we are coming up now to May 1st, uh, but the good thing about May 1st is that now all of the government programs are active. So coming up into April 1st wise, there were no government programs. Um, they were talking about them, but we, there was a lot of unknowns. Now we're coming up to May 1st, the, the, the government programs to provide income to individuals that may have lost their jobs are coming through now. Um, so that's a huge positive wise. So for landlords that are concerned about rent, um, you can always guide your tenants to these, these programs where they can start uh, receiving funds for the properties wise. Um, now, let's get into guidelines for questions wise. So for questions wise, any questions you may have, you can ask them in the question and answer box down below, uh, and we'll be handling those at the end of uh, the first half, which is introducing ourselves, talking about different stories, things that you can do. And um, 
we'll we'll do what there are going to be many questions that are the same so we're going to kind of take block them all up okay one general question wise and how that applies to yours so um so we'll we'll, we'll generalize the questions wise um and then have them answered there anyone that has a case currently with the landlord and tenant board um unfortunately we cannot address it it could be a conflict of interest for elaine wise so anything that is currently with the landlord and tenant board that has a case number uh, we will not be addressing we cannot address that because of um, elaine's status she doesn't know if she's going to be in conflict of interest or not or there could be another party that's dealing with it so we will not be handling those questions wise but i can tell you oh go ahead elaine yeah i was also going to say <clears throat> If you already have a representative that you have uh, hired to handle your case, um, I will not comment on a case where a colleague has already been retained. Yeah, yeah, which which completely makes sense wise, that kind of thing. Um, and number two, and questions that we've been getting a lot of, and as the month's gone on, in the last webinar, lots of questions based on this, the short term rentals, the Airbnb style rentals wise. Um, we are going to we, we won't be addressing direct questions on that on this call we may have a be able to do a call in the future wise to, to handle that specific question wise but the good news is we have sourced out uh, a, a colleague of elaine's a lawyer that has the ability to address issues with those items uh for uh for the landlords that are engaged in airbnb or may have uh, contracts with com with companies that do Airbnb rentals wise um, and are now running in issues with those. Um, so Elaine uh, will be sharing that individual's information as well. This whole um, webinar is is uh, being recorded and there'll be a recap email that goes out. We will include that individual's information in that recap email because I know that is a burning question for a lot of people that have been engaging in that. Um, and you know, I'll let that segue into my my next topic wise. Um, this is not a time that you want to be selling your property. You want to buy, not buy, you want to hold on to your property. This period will end and the fundamentals of the real estate, the Toronto real estate market will, will still exist wise. Um, demand has decreased right now. So if you sell in a, in a, in a, at a time when demand is low, then you're gonna to have to take a cut in your price wise. So this is not a time when you wanna sell your property. Also, this is a time when you actually wanna work with your tenants because you do not want a vacant rental property at this time either. Properties will become vacant and we will have to rent them out and we do have those services that can help landlords rent those out. But if you can avoid renting out your property at this time, you do wanna avoid renting out the property. And why I'm bringing that in as a segue after talking about short-term rentals wise, is that the short-term rental business is utterly for the most part shut down wise so all those properties that were on airbnb or uh, i think it's vrbo uh, those are now have now entered the long-term rental market so if a few of you were on the call i was asking kyle to call like what are the rentals at 300 front street for example um so 300 front street was a building that allowed airbnb style rentals so currently in that building there are 52 rentals on the market. Another popular Airbnb building was 12 and 14 York. And I pulled that building up right before the call. Currently there are 124 rentals in those two towers for long-term rentals. So not only do we see a decrease in demand for rentals wise due to our short term, remember the short term in the grand scheme of things, scheme of things short term um, market correction wise, I shouldn't even see correction in, the, in our short term market wise, we're seeing a decreased demand, but then a subsequent increase in supply because now you have all of these rentals that were originally Airbnb being converted into the long term rental market. So, what that means is now we're having a downward pressure on rental prices. As long as the borders remain closed to both immigrants and international students remember we get a we have a, over a hundred thousand international students at any given time in the gta we may miss out on that international student population in 2020 um, if universities aren't resuming regular class schedules september 1st and the borders remain closed 
So that's a huge impact to the uh, transient rental market that comes in during the summer months. So again, another reason why you want to be working with your tenants. These aren't panic. I'm not trying to cause panic wise. I'm just telling people what the reality of the situation is today. The medium and long term prospects of the Toronto market still remain the exact same. It, it is a fantastic market to be in. Everything right now is short term. So you want to come up with short term solutions so that you can benefit and maintain your wealth over the medium and long term. Now, without further ado, let's give Elaine the floor. Elaine Page, thank you so much for your time again. Um, why don't we start off you explain what a paralegal is, what your services are, and we'll jump right into it. Thank you. Oh, so Alex, so happy to be here again. Um, and thank you and Kyle for doing all this. It's really terrific. Um, so uh, I am a paralegal. So as, as Alex said, I'm licensed with the Law Society of Ontario. And we are unique. We are the only place in the world where there is such an animal as a, a licensed paralegal. And uh, so not to be confused with um, in the States when you see on TV paralegals who are um, assisting lawyers, we actually are litigators. We're allowed to be in court. We're allowed to be in the tribunals. We have um, a limited scope of practice. So for example, I wouldn't be able to do a murder trial, but I could do your traffic ticket for you. I don't, don't ask me about them. I don't do traffic. Um, so there are certain areas with which we can practice in and we have to carry errors and omission insurance. insurance. We have accountability to the law society uh, and just like any other regulated industry. And um, it's important that if you are getting help on a landlord and tenant matter that you are getting it from a licensee of the Law Society because there are a lot of real estate agents out there who are giving advice on landlord tenant and A, they're not licensed to do it and B, sometimes the advice they're giving is not correct. So you don't have to necessarily reach out to me. There is 10,000 of us and uh, we're happy to, um, to help you in any way we can. If you need referrals in your area, I have people pretty much around the province. Um, otherwise, the Ontario Paralegal Association has a whole list <clears throat> of paralegals who are licensed and ready to help you. So that's, that's who I am and that's what we do. So I want to jump into the short term because over the last couple of weeks, I've been getting a ton of calls on the short term um, rentals. So Alex, you were talking about Airbnb and um, the other ones, I've forgotten the names. The truth is that there are all of these companies out there now that are not as well known as, let's say, Airbnb, um, that as, as an investor, you're, you rent your unit to that corporate entity. So I'm just going to make up a name. Let's call it apartment, uh, I don't know, um, Elaine's, Elaine's Rentals, Inc., Mm -hmm. So you would go ahead and rent to Elaine's Rental Inc. And Elaine would then go ahead and rent either daily, weekly, monthly to whomever. And there's tons of those. And it's a great opportunity for you to be making investment income, or so you think. From where I sit, it's a nightmare. Um, it's a nightmare because it's a question, it becomes a question as to, whether this is a commercial lease agreement or a residential lease agreement, it becomes a nightmare because under the legislation, you cannot uh, sublet a unit for a higher price than the actual rental unit is. So what do I mean by that? If the rental unit is $1,000 a month, I can't turn around and re-rent that overnight to somebody for $200 a night because then I'm, I'm, working against what the act says. So it becomes a nightmare at the board, at the landlord and tenant board about how to deal with these. And this was before COVID. Um, there was some case law that I did a number of years ago with supportive housing that basically, um, you know, is being used in these cases. And it talks about being joint landlords and it's, it's a nightmare. So, um, so for those of you who are in a situation now where 
that's exactly what's going on. You've, you've rented your investment property to a company who in turn rents it on a daily, weekly basis. Um, you're out of luck when it comes to the landlord tenant board that this is for the most part, depending on what your lease agreement says, this is a commercial tenancy and there are separate rules and they're very complex. And, um, there's a, a colleague of mine named Doug Levitt, who is pretty much the expert on these. We'll be giving you his contact information later at the end of this. And Doug will be able to ascertain fairly quickly whether you've got a commercial lease or a, um, a residential lease and what's the course of action. So from despite what Alex just said about getting rid of tenants, um, as a general rule, non-COVID-19, I would not recommend doing these sorts of agreements, these short-term lease agreements. They are, if typically what happens is the companies get greedy and they stop paying you. Because they, and, and this is, I've gotten, in the last year, I don't know how many calls where the company basically said, oh, we're short on finances, we're not paying you or we're moving in there ourselves and now it's a residential unit or some kind of game playing. <clears throat> and it leaves you sitting there with no control of your asset. So if you're an investor and you actually don't wanna be a hands-on investor, you just wanna own the property, collect the money and not have to worry about your unit, the best advice I can give you is hire a property manager, a property management company, who oversees everything and at the end of the month cuts you, you know, your check. That is the way to do it. And that's the way that what's important about that is if there is a problem with the tenant, there is a inexpensive mechanism to deal with the tenant. Whereas with these short term rentals that I'm talking about, Doug's having to take people to superior court because that's the proper jurisdiction and it's hugely expensive. So you have been warned, my friends. Now's a good opportunity to shift how you're doing business and let yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, just on the short term wise, I, you know, we, we've been, we promote investment in condos. Uh, I've never ever advised anyone to buy on the basis of, basis of the investment fundamentals uh, behind short term rentals. So even before I started selling real estate, I worked at a company called Dell Suites, which is a subsidiary of Tridel. And they did short-term furnished rentals. Now, it was uh, rentals were 30 days plus. So, so it wasn't the daily stuff or anything that Airbnb does. It has to be 30 days plus. And it was in buildings that in their condo bylaws allowed 30 days plus. So the key thing is about 30 days plus. At 30 days plus, it's not viewed as a hotel. If you do less than 30 days stays, it's actually viewed as a hotel cell accommodation. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going on a bit of a tangent wise, but, but what I, but I always knew because I was, this was uh, like 13, 14 years ago doing this before there was Airbnb or anything like that, that anything less than 30 days would, would have been subject as a hotel. So what that means is that you are then a commercial property. So then you have to pay commercial property tax. Uh, and then you all, then uh, that was the main thing. You have to pay commercial property tax. So I always knew that the, the, the Airbnb model wise from a legislation standpoint in regards to taxation wise and everything like that, when the hotels wanted to fight back, when they have very, very deep pockets, they could fight back and they had a lot of things that they could fight back with. So I never, I never promoted it because I knew that it was only going to be a matter of time before that something would happen. Now something's happened. It, it wasn't a legislation based wise, but it, it is, it is a, um, it's a stars like situation where the hospitality industry is, is devastated because no one's coming to the city. You can't stay in the properties, blah, 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 blah. So as Elaine said, just better to get into the, lo the, the long-term rental wise. Um, you're, are you going to make the same cash you were before on a monthly basis? No, but that wasn't sustainable anyways. Um, it wasn't sustainable in, in legislation wise or anything like that 13, 14 years ago. Um, so it, it was something that was going to be bound to happen one way or another. Is there a definition of what short term is? Is it 28 days, 30 days? Is there a cutoff? 30. 
uh, but, maybe 28, May 30. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would have to look. Let's just say a month. The more critical piece is who's the lease agreement with. So you were yeah, referring yeah, to agreement. a particular company. So if mm -hmm. if uh, if John Smith was renting the unit for 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, and the landlord is named as that company, mm -hmm. then that's a problem. That it doesn't matter. It becomes a huge problem because that company is then, it, that company doesn't own the unit. They're doing it on behalf of an owner. And that's mm -hmm. where the problem lies. So yeah. um, anyway, so what's happened is in, with the co in this time, um, the Ontario government has said no short-term, you know, no short-term leases, like not happening unless it's for uh, a frontline worker. So, you know, these companies are kind of going behind the back and saying, oh yeah, so-and-so is a, as a frontline worker and, you know, like maybe they're a dog groomer, I don't know. Um, so they're trying to get away with it that way. But what happened at a downtown building this week, and I, I know this because the client called me, um, is a particular condominium decided to change the fobs uh, and all the passes to any tenants who were in there under short-term leases. They got locked out and uh, the police were involved. There's a court case that's going to be launched tomorrow. Um, and the condo took the position that no short-term leases under the emergency order should be happening, even though in the, these particular cases, the, the short-term tenants had been there for months. Um, and they also took the position, and it's a strange position for them to take, uh, that the, um, the, uh, these folks who were coming in were from the states and they were putting the entire building at risk and property management and the board decided that because these folks were allegedly at risk that they shouldn't be allowed into um into the building which you know if you know anything about what's going on you know that if we've been exposed we're supposed to self-isolate in our units so it was a ridiculous position to take but the point is um <clears throat> there's all sorts of shenanigans that have begun and this was the first major one and I've, I've heard of a few more and so my my reminder to all of you is that regardless of what's going on in the world and how frustrated you might be and how much you desperately might need your rent money do not take justice into your own hands right and uh, I just had a I just see in the chat John wise uh, John, uh, you know we're, you know, we actually probably spent way too much time talking about the short term wise. Uh, so we'll 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 get off the short term wise, and now now let's get back onto the main topic, which is, um, you're you're a landlord, you have a property, um, tenant has come to you, uh, they're asking, oh well, I've lost my job, or I'm reduced pay or reduced hours, can I? Can you give me free rent? Can I reduce my rent? Uh, Elaine, how would you handle that situation? Okay, so I think terminology is really, really important because yeah. people inter interchange terminology. So let me just give you some definitions so that we are all on the same page. A rent reduction is um, um, something that can happen over a fixed period of time or for the remaining portion of the lease. So if you're going to do any sort of rent reduction, you need to be clear about whether this is for two months or for the remaining portions of the year. My caution to you, because we don't know how long this is going on, is a rent reduction, do not do it more than 11 months, because if you reduce the rent for 12 months, then that becomes the lawful rent. So that's a rent reduction. A rent abatement is, the rent is $2,000, there's been some maintenance issues, there's been some problems, Here's $500 to keep and put in your pocket and you're abating, you're giving back some of the rent. So um, those two terms get used interchangeably, but they are not the same. So what I have been saying since the beginning of this is that these tenants are in control of your asset and you need to work with them. There's different mechanisms with which you can do that. One is to allow them to use their last month's rent deposit or April's rent. 
Uh, if you do that, you're going to put it in writing that there's no longer a last month's rent deposit and make sure that they get a copy of that because when they end up leaving, they're going to forget that they got that. <clears throat> the other is to negotiate a settlement or an agreement with them. And I would do this on a month to month basis because we don't know how long that, you know, obviously May we've got a problem, but maybe by June things are going to be back to the new normal. So we don't know. So I put a time limit on any agreement and I would say that it's to be um, reviewed on a per month basis. So if we get into a situation where we're not backing up in, into the world until July, every month you're doing something, you're revisiting this issue with your tenant. Uh, I would also, depending on the situation, be issuing N4s and an N4 is a notice to terminate for non-payment of rent. But I would be explaining to the tenant that you're doing this as a means of protecting yourself and you're not going to act on it if you come to an agreement. So what do I mean? Uh, I'm going to pay by April 25th. Okay. And if you don't, um, we're going to move on the end four. April 25th comes rolling around. They don't pay. Then the end four kicks in. So you've got some kind of insurance policy. You have yeah. to be careful about just last point about forgiving rent versus deferring rent because you're not necessarily forgiving rent sorry alex go ahead oh that, that's exactly what i was going to what, what i was going to tell people that going back to the terminology wise so um when you're working with your tenants wise and let's say they've they've approached you and say there there is an issue uh with them coming up with the full amount of the rent wise you are not going to give them a, you know, even using the word reduction is, is the wrong word to use. It's we'll give you a deferral of the rent and then you can negotiate with them what that deferral is. So let's say the rent's $2,000 a month and you settle on 1500 um, on a month by month basis, as Elaine said, you know, deal with it month by month wise. And then what you're going to do is you're going to defer that 500. So, what that means is just like what the banks are doing with the mortgages wise, you still owe that money uh, as a tenant wise, you're still occupying the unit. So that money will be due at some point later in the future wise, once things get back to normal. So let's say you defer $500 a month um, and you, you end up doing that for, now we're moving to May, May, June, July. Um, they would, owe, by doing this process wise and then setting up an N4 situation, you then, accumulated three months of a deferral of 500, which is $1,500. Now you have a mechanism in place to collect that money in the future wise. And that's when you're going to, again, work with the tenant to get that money back. Everything right now is having dialogue and communication with your tenant wise. On one side, you have an investment asset and investment property wise. You have, you have no forgiveness on your costs associated with running that property wise. So the tenants have to understand that, that there's no, no deferral of your, maybe a deferral of your mortgage wise, but probably not. So there's, there's your monthly obligations remain fixed wise, but you understand that they're, they're in a tough spot. So you're gonna allow them maybe a potential uh, deferral of a portion of their rent wise, but you have to do it in the right manner so that you have the mechanism to collect it when things go back to normal. Um, that's the key thing to do. Now, you're stressed, the tenant's stressed because they don't have money coming in. This is a recipe for an explosion. You know, you could, you could be throwing diesel fuel on a fire wise. Sometimes it's best to bring, bring a, uh, another individual and to have those conversations if you hit a brick wall, um, or really a lot, of, and we have it because we've had these conversations, a lot of these times the tenants are, can be taking advantage of the situation because they're like, you know what, things are tough. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that uh, my situation becomes, a, is, is paramount over the landlord situation. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna offer them less money per month. Um, you need to have a, for lack of a better term, a great bullshit reader into what 
the tenant is saying to you and knowing how to answer, to ask the correct questions to make sure the tenant is actually being truthful to you. A lot of things that we said before, you know, one thing, one thing you can ask for, doesn't mean the tenant's going to give it to you, but one thing you can ask for to detect the bullshit, ask for a record of employment to confirm that they've actually been let go. If they've been let go, they have to be sent a record of employment. Um, so ask for that record of employment. Um, that's a, one specific thing to show that they've been let go. But if you're up against a brick wall, you know, you can bring someone like an Elaine in to have those conversations for you to set the correct mechanisms in place and has 25 years plus of hearing bullshit and lies from people and knowing when they're actually uh, pulling your leg and, and, and not giving you the, the correct information uh, wise. But because we've lost the ability to go to the next step of eviction wise, it's important to have that dialogue, ask the correct question and know when to call bullshit on the, on the people on the other end. And we've been calling a lot of bullshit this month for our clients wise. And um, actually, I think Elaine, great segue in talking about calling bullshit. Why don't you tell us some stories about some situations? Now, I just noticed some people asking when questions are going to be answered. At the end of this, we'll be answering all more direct questions wise. But Elaine's going to share some situations that she's actually specifically dealt with. And there's always great ways to derive information by hearing actual stories. Right. Um, and so before I do that, I just want to, and it kind of leads into the stories. So, you know, we've been getting tenants. <clears throat> if you have a tenant who has not paid their merch's rent, um, don't make deals with that tenant. Um, go ahead and issue your end for it because they had a problem before COVID. And, and so you need to actually address that. And so those are the ones who are going to come with, to you with the, the stories. They're the ones who have been persistently late paying over the period of time who suddenly will have been laid off. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm hearing all, uh, you know, I, <laughs> one of the tenants that I did contact this week started to give me a story about how she had been laid off. And I asked for a record of employment and um, she didn't have one. And I asked her about whether or not she was eligible for any of the benefit programs. And she says she wasn't. And so I asked her what she did for a living and she didn't, she hesitated. And I don't even remember what she said, but the reality is she's a hooker and um, she's not, you know, working at the moment because, you know, it's, it's exceptionally dangerous for her. So, um, you know, with her, we're going to have to figure out, like I told her, you can't just not pay your rent and, and we're going to be issuing with an N4 and you have things available to you to get money. And if you choose not to do that, then you, you know, that's your problem. I'm really sorry. So that was a good example of the bullshit meter. You know, she tried to tell me that she was some executive at some company, but at the end of the day, she was a hooker. <laughs> Um, so, so you have to kind of listen to these stories and we're getting stories of, I'm an international student. Um, and you know, generally speaking, anybody who's come to Canada as an international student, student and is renting a unit out for three or $4,000 a month and are, they're not eligible for any of the benefit programs. Most of those folks come from big money from whatever country they're from and have the ability to write home and say, send me some money, I'm going, you know, and they're, they haven't been doing that. So <clears throat> you have to really assess who, what's going on with the individuals. So there are people who will basically say, because I'm a student, I don't have to pay. There's this sense of entitlement um, because uh, 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 of this situation. On the flip side of this, I got a call from a tenant who is a frontline worker, an ICU nurse uh, at one of the major hospitals, and she's basically um, working uh, nonstop in the ICU, taking care of COVID-19 patients. And there's a dispute over her hydro bill that she's supposed to pay a portion of. And the landlord has told her that if she doesn't pay it, he's taking her to collections and 
ruining her credit bureau. So, I mean, that's just, excuse my expression for swearing, but what an asshole thing to do, right? Like here's somebody who's risking their life for all of us and you're worrying about $200 hydro bill. So this is why I say common sense dictates. Now, if she wasn't who she was, she might wreck the unit now because she's mad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that's, yeah, remember, you, 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 people, you're dealing with 100, 200, not 100, nothing 100 out there. You're dealing with uh, th things that are, that are most, most likely worth north of 500,000. So these are the caretakers of your properties wise. So very important to have these conversations. And I'll bring Kyle in, for example, wise, he has a number of investment condos as well. He has a bartender that lives in one of his units. Been a great tenant the entire time. He's had a conversation. He had a conversation with his tenant in March. Wise, um, she reached out to him. She said he's laid off. She's laid off. He knows that, right? She still paid her rent April first. Wise, I'm sure that she applied for, applied for the benefit programs uh, through that were available through the government. Wise, now have you heard from her again, Kyle, this month or? No, but we'll be touching base again before yeah. next month's rent. And that's somewhere where he knows, okay, legitimate situation. She definitely doesn't have any income coming in. Let's work together and, and, and see the situations as, as they evolve and everything like that. So um, I would say 90%, 95% of the situations with easy dialogue, situations are going to be resolved. Now, I do see cases coming in in regards to on the webinar chat. I haven't even opened the questions yet. Kyle's moderating those. There are going to be people that are taking advantage of the situation. Uh, we've already brought up an international student, um, which we've had some of those cases on our end as well. Um, and and Elaine, Elaine will get it more into to when you have more difficult situations. And that's where you, having a, a, a bulldog um, sometimes is your next resort if you're really up against a brick wall where I said, that, yeah, they're right there. What if the tenant has recently changed his contact number? And didn't provide the new number and not answering email that's basically out of reach yeah you, you're you're in a new level of situation wise you probably got to bring someone someone in wise a bulldog wise and knows how to deal with these situations and how i know elaine is that i've used her personally uh when i bought my actually this is a great thing about the n12 so i'll talk about the n12 quickly then we'll talk about how to properly do forms the n12 is the form because we get this question now, okay, I'm going to move into the unit. I'll solve my problem. I'm going to move into the unit to get the tenant out. I'll owner occupy the unit. So again, evictions for owner occupied situations, um, those aren't applicable right now either. And again, even before this whole crisis wise, those were the biggest issues in the landlord and tenant board in regards to landlords abusing that case and everything. So I bought my wife and I, we bought our property and we bought the triplex and we were moving into one of the units wise and the form, um, the seller was to complete the form and provide proper notice to the, to the tenant wise. Cause we were going to own or occupy that unit wise. It was incorrectly done. And we weren't the, when we bought, when we got the keys to the property, the tenant was still in there here. I'm, I'm a real estate agent wise. And I was stuck with a tenant and I was, I ended up being homeless and I'm like, how, like, how does this happen? I should know better. Um, and that's where really when you have to have someone help you with the situation, we brought a lane in. Um, worst case scenario was we weren't going to get the, we weren't going to be able to move in until October and we closed in August and she was able to resolve the situation in, in about four weeks. So why I'm telling a story, it's the segue into the actual forms. The landlord and tenant board focuses on the letter of the law. You truly have to dot your I's and cross your T's. It is so important that the forms are filled out correctly because if you have someone that knows what they were, are doing and if they go to the board and your form is incorrectly filled out, so the, the board will just crumple the paper, throw it in the garbage. You got to set the whole process over again so it could be another two months dealing with that situation um, and you've already been dealing with it for two months previously beyond uh, before that so it is so important that everything is done correctly wise take common sense out the window when you actually go to the board level wise it is rule of the law i's dotted t's crossed and elaine why don't you get into this we've talked about this before who can actually sign those forms right. when you're issuing it to the, to the tenants wise right thank you um so 
as, as I mentioned before, um, we're getting all sorts of real estate agents signing these forms. They're getting thrown out. At, and in some cases, they're totally being, if the form is signed by somebody who is not either the actual landlord or a licensee of the law society, the risk in that is that the entire case gets thrown out. So you do your notices, you wait 20 days or 15 days, to issue an application. There's a backlog at the board for a whole political variety of reasons. So you wait three months to get a hearing date and, um, and you get to the hearing and you find out, no, the N4 was not done correctly or it was signed by someone who was not authorized to sign it. Bye-bye, start over again. And, and I learned so much by being on these calls with Elaine. I've signed these forms in the past as well and everything like that. Um, if th th these are the worst case sit scenario situations when you end up at the board wise, like since the board's closed um, and there are already issues and backlog with the board wise with not the num right number of adjudicators and everything before this whole crisis, now we hit the crisis wise, now it's not even open. So imagine it could be three, it could be six months, then the board opens back up. And then you, in three months more time, you actually get your case wise and then they tell you your form is filled incorrectly and then they throw it out and then you got to start the whole process over again. Um, there is, I, I just thinking about this now, there's probably so much misinformation out there and so many people that are scrambling in this crisis time. Um, this is a time when you really want to do things correctly wise. You don't have the market to bail you out this time in regards to I'll just rent it for more later. I'll just sell it for more later. In, in the short term, in the long term, we'll be fine. But in the short term wise, everything needs to be correctly wise. And to mitigate your short term losses, it, it is best to, to have everything uh, done correctly with these properties wise. Um, so just Alex, I saw something yeah. come up in the chat about somebody asked, can a property manager sign the notices? This is exactly the situation that I'm talking about. The answer is no. Your property manager will tell you, I've been signing them for years. Of course I can sign them. And they have been signing them for years, um, but the rule has changed. And- uh, Yeah, well, yeah, we gotta, talk, we gotta talk about rule changes. Yeah, like that, yeah, we gotta go into the rule. Yeah, the rules have changed, rules have changed. And then, and Colleen caught me two weeks ago, I brought this up, I'm like, yeah, if you don't collect rent, uh, you can go to small claims court and collect the rent and Elaine's like, uh-uh, nope, can't do that anymore. So in December, there was a change uh, in legislation wise in regards to, the, it's basically the, the, the stick handling of, okay, well, the, the small claims court don't want to handle it. They're, they're kicking it back to the landlord and the tenant board. It, it, why don't you explain more into that? So right now, currently as legislation stands, if you want uncollected rent, you cannot go to small claims court, correct yeah. Elaine? It, yeah, it's complicated. I don't want to dive too much into yeah. it, but before, it used to, so basically you can issue an application at the landlord and tenant board up until the day the tenant leaves. Once a tenant's gone, as a landlord, you have no right to issue an application at the board. Conversely, tenants um, can issue applications against landlords for one year after they vacate it. So for those landlords who have done inspections, after the tenant has vacated or um, the tenant did a midnight move. In the past, we've gone to the small claims court and sought out an order for um, a judgment for the arrears of rent. Long story short, there was a case that happened, it got appealed and the, the appeal court said, no, the proper jurisdiction is the landlord and tenant board, despite the fact that the landlord and tenant board won't issue an actual application for you. And it is on another level of appeal presently. And as well, I think the Ford government is making some changes to the act. So in this moment, you, you really have a problem issuing a claim in the small claims court for rent arrears. That may change in a month. That may change in three weeks. It may change in six months. I don't know, but in this moment, it's a problem. And I just want to go back to the, the forms by a property management company. And, and again, I, I own a property management company. It's, it's a really easy solution to, to solve wise. So either you know, a paralegal or someone registered with the law society can sign it or the landlord. Okay. We've, once I found this, we implemented. 
you just DocuSign electronic signature, the form over to the landlord and they sign it. It's, it's a really easy step. So it, it, yeah, go ahead, Aline. It is easy, except I have clients who are doing, you know, I represent a number of property managers mm -hmm. who have portfolios yep. of several hundred uh, units. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem is when you're using DocuSign, it, it doesn't put the dates in correctly. It's, so you have to be very careful. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know at the bottom, that. well, but I, if people are doing this, I want to make sure that they don't. Yeah, sure, of course. Them. Yep, yep. So at the bottom of an N4, for example, it, it, it has the date, the date of signing. And so if I were doing it today, according to the form, it would be 20 slash 4 slash 2020. So April 20th. But when DocuSign does it, it puts the month first. So it would go 4 slash 20 slash 2020. You do that and you try to get put it into the board it's defective because the date's wrong it's not in there for there, there, yeah there there you go guys like just 25 plus years experience i i, I don't even know what to say you know, that, that i was just going to say i know that but i didn't know that uh but the, uh, i will tell people the solution on that is what you would do is in, in docusign you can manually type it out and everything but again just shows you why it's so important for these documents to be filled out correctly. And I want to, I also want to emphasize, you want to avoid the landlord and tenant board, you know, it, by all costs. Like you don't want to go to the landlord and tenant board. This is the method of last resort. So this is where conversation dialogue is so, so key because you do not want to go that down that road. If you've gone down, down that road, you, you, you uh, communication has failed. Sides have built their brick walls. They're entrenched. Um, it is, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a fun place to, to go down and it's going to take time, money, stress. Um, if you want to have the dialogue to avoid that with all costs wise. So I, I just wanted to, to stress that with individuals, just like any lawyer wise, you know, you don't really want to go into litigation. You, 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 let's, let's avoid going to litigation. Let's get the parties at the table, have this discussion point wise, because we don't want to end up going down that road. Um, it, it just, it's always a matter of last resort to, to want to go down. And, and sometimes what it does, it will take uh, the landlord, you're going to have to suffer maybe a small loss. Uh, but sometimes it's better to write that loss off. So what I mean by writing it off, um, I had questions on that before, your, your interest, your maintenance fees, your property taxes, all those costs can be written off against your income brought in on the rent wise. So what I mean by write it off, it, anything damages wise, it can all be written off on the income wise uh, against the property wise. And over the long term, uh, you'll, you'll be fine and you'll, you'll make more money. Um, and Alex, are there currently yeah, ways to reduce any of those costs? Reduce what costs? Like mortgage, property taxes, maintenance fees. No, no. Uh, and and when, I'm, when I'm saying no wise, uh, property taxes, uh, the payment period for those has been deferred. Um, I don't remember what the exact date is, um, but your next installment of property taxes, the, that date has been deferred wise when you owe that to the uh, city of Toronto, um, specifically talking about the city of Toronto wise. Uh, you can talk to your financial representative at the bank wise to see if there's a potential to defer your mortgage uh, wise. Um, so there is potential there. Maintenance fees, absolutely not. Um, the building still needs to run, um, so there'll be no deferral on the maintenance fees wise. Uh, so yeah, so there's no real way to, to reduce those costs. Just maybe a potential of deferral wise. Can, can I um, just, I just was taking a quick look at some of the questions. I just want to say, because this keeps coming up and, and maybe it'll make it easier for some of you. Um, this there there's there's tenants who are just not communicating they they're just you're writing to them saying hey how you doing hope you're okay let's talk about the rent and they're they've gone they've changed their number they're not answering emails in those cases you need to start eviction proceedings right away there's something wrong there if you're if you're a legitimate person who's got um a problem i mean unless they're sick i mean try you know if they're sick and then in ICU, that's a different story, but um, you, you know, if you're a straight up person and you need to defer 
your rent, you'll speak to your landlord and let them know and let them know what your situation is. If you ignore them um, and, and, you know, do this at your landlord, you can't evict me, ha ha. Um, that's when you really need to start moving quickly because that, that is a huge red flag for me that there's a problem there. Yeah. And that, and that's definitely your, your time to read, reach out to pro professionals wise. What, what, what can you do? You know, you need experience, right? That, that is experience what the, what the situation is and everything like that. And this goes back to, again, having the dialogue with the tenants. If the tenant has stopped giving you communication wise, yeah, the huge red flag, you, you, you definitely need help. And uh, Elaine's contact information um, will be shared with, with everyone here. So definitely, um, time to reach out to someone for professional help. I'd say great time for questions, guys. Should we open up the questions? Yeah. So, so Kyle's our moderator on our questions here. Um, so he's going to go through these. Uh, and uh, a lot of them will be similar wise. So um, if we cover a topic with one question, it's going to kind of cover maybe some of the other questions too. Yeah, Elaine, there have been a lot of questions around N4s and when they should be issued. Each situation is unique. It really depends on your relationship with your tenant. So as I just said, if you have non-communicative tenants, you should be doing an N4 today. And you haven't got your April's rent, you should be doing an N4 today. Um, uh, it, 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 it really depends on a case-by-case -case situation. If you've made a deal where 90% of the rent is being paid and it's 10% that's being deferred, you don't need to do an N4. If, uh, if you've got a rental unit that's $4,000 a month and you're, the, the tenant's only getting $2,000 a month, you're likely only going to get 1,000 of that, I would be doing an N4. Just because you do an N4 doesn't mean that you have to issue an application, but it gives you the flexibility to issue an application down the line if, if things don't um, uh, work themselves out. I would also like say to you that if you're doing that, let the tenant know that you're doing this not to be mean or horrible, but it's your insurance policy that your rights are protected. Yeah, and again, open dialogue, communicative dialogue, not threatening dialogue, um, explaining to the tenant what the end for is. So it, it, it allows you to, if down the road you need to rectify the situation, you have the ability to rectify the situation. So Elaine, what happens if you issue the N4 to them, then they end up paying their full rent? Then the N4, is, yay, number one, yay for you. Um, that's the best case scenario. We want that to happen. And this, this is uh, true whether we're in COVID-19 or in any other time. If, it, if you issue a notice of termination for non-payment of rent and the payment, uh, the rent is paid in full, then it's done. It's finished. It's over. We carry on. So I hope that happens for you. Yeah. And, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I would say 90 to 95% of the cases by having open dialogue and doing these procedures wise will resolve themselves through, through a method like this. You know, maybe not today, but to, maybe not tomorrow, but in a week or two weeks, uh, th things will resolve. Okay. Next question, Kyle. So then what happens if say next month, then they don't pay their full amount again. Would you issue a new one for? It's a, yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. There's confusion around this. So if you issue an N4 mid-month and you get paid at the end of the month, then that N4 is dead. It, it's, and so the next month coming, you would issue a new N4. However, if you issue an N4 mid-month and you don't get paid, and then the next month comes rolling around, don't issue a second N4. Your N4 carries you over for the entire period of time that you're not being paid. What are steps to get tenants to actually pay? Is there anything you can really do? Oh, we, we club them over the head. I mean, <laughs> um, I would say, you know, again, I don't know how many times Alex has said this and I couldn't agree more. Um, communication is number one, number two, and four. Um, and I will also tell you that if they're a particularly difficult tenant, sometimes it's better to have an N4 done by a third party because then uh, they know you're serious because you've retained somebody to act on your behalf. So it depends on your tenant and your relationship with them. And this, uh, is, this is uh, the yeah, process. 
Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'm, I'm going to give an example back to my own personal experience with Elaine Wise. Now, this, what was done, you cannot do right now because um, what, what, are the, what are the people that deliver things? Serve. You can't Process serve people. Right? Yeah. So there are none of those right now. But this is where when you have someone that knows how to, let's say, knows how to collect the rent within the legal parameters or to, knows how to push the buttons to get someone to jump. You know, for example, when, when I was in the situation wise, and I needed to, to get my home, um, you know, uh, the process server went to the person's work and, and delivered that directly to them. So Elaine knows the different processes when you're starting to get up against the wall. Some of these things you can do on your own to begin with, but if you're starting to get up against the wall, uh, that's where you can bring someone in. Or if you're someone that's just like, I don't want to deal with this stuff, you know, there, there's professionals that can, that can start doing it. And can resolve the situation hopefully quickly uh, by pressing the right buttons that need to be pressed. Thanks, Alex. And Elaine, how do you submit the N4 to the board? Is it electronically, is it written? Great question. Yeah, so the, the N4 has a timeline on it. It has to be served. And when it's up, you can do what's called an e-file. There, there's, um, so the, the, the piece that goes with the N4, the next stage in the proceeding is called an L1 application. You can e-file those on the landlord and tenant board website. Um, normally you would get a hearing date with those, but they're not handing out hearing dates, but at least you'll get a file number at the board and you'll be in queue. Great. So Oksana asks, um, my tenant ignored my request to sign the consent form for communication via email and he lives in a condo. So how can I serve him as appropriate notices? Uh, regular mail, but if you're going to serve a notice by regular mail, you need to tack on five extra days. This is the mistake that people make all the time. So if it's a 14 day notice or 15 day notice, the date, uh, and you're sending it by regular mail, which is perfectly fine, then you need to have the termination date on the 20th day of the month, not the 15th. Great. Aaron asks, um, mainly it's a question around rent increases where he wants to work with his tenant and may you know, pay it for this year or kind of nullify it. How does he protect himself for next year and make sure that he can continue with the uh, rent increases? Yeah, that's a little more complicated. He should be serving the N1 notices for increase and then he can preserve his rights in a, an agreement for the future year, like wave yeah. it and it's a yeah, I, more complicated. Yeah, like, like basically what, what it would be then, it kind of, you're, you just be deferring your, yeah, you, you'd have a separate agreement that you would do that kind of thing. Now, I, I'm, I'm glad that's brought up. Um, I can say for all our clients wise, we've suspended increases wise. I don't, this is me personally wise. Uh, I know Elaine feels the same way and Kyle feels the same way. This is not the time to be doing increases wise. Um, I would just avoid it, not do the increase, um, and just do the increase. You can do the increase later this year. You just do 90 days notice. That's all you have to do for the increase wise. So, you know, I would just, okay, you know what, and not, and maybe push, you know, we're not going to do it for May 1st anymore for May 1st issue, a new N1 form. So in 90 days, we're going to increase the rent and if the situation hasn't improved then just do it, just do it that way. I would say that's probably a cleaner way. Would you agree, Elaine? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I personally, that's, that's what I would do. We've suspended uh, rental increases. We don't think they're, they're a good idea because what it is, you don't want the tenant moving out right now. Um, not the time you want to work with your tenant wise. And, and I would say that it's not the time to do it, but yeah, there's ways for you to do it wise, but I would just suspend your, your, your increase for May 1st. And uh, if you want to be a nice guy um, and, or a nice girl, and uh, just do it later on. But again, that's your prerogative, how you run your portfolio, but that's my professional investment. Great, thanks, Alex. Brenda is a small landlord who has an empty apartment. Is she able to show it? Yes. No. <laughs> oh. Depends, well, depends, oh, oh. depends, depends. I should say, so, so here's what it comes down to. Depends if your building allows showing. So, yeah, sorry, fair enough, uh, but it's a basement so, apartment. I assumed it was a house. Oh, basement apartment, yeah, yeah, you can do showings. You can do whatever you want. So, again, going into, if I'm, if I'm zoning in on condos-wise, there are buildings now in Toronto, a lot of buildings, 
that have a lim- that have banned real estate showings in the building wide. So um, it is difficult for you to show those properties to prospective tenants and, and or buyer sellers, that kind of thing. Another reason why you don't want an empty property right now, because your building could be on that list and it'd be very challenging to get someone to go through and, and look at the property right now. Um, so I would say that it, it, it depends on, on if the building's on, but it, but I, I can say I have a basement apartment up for rent right now and anyone can come see it if, if they want. So with your own personal residence, yes. Yeah, right. And, and just to tap onto that, um, if you have a unit that presently has a tenant in it, um, I wouldn't be showing that unit, it, even if it's, it, whether it's a condo or not, if you have a house and it's got tenants and we're all supposed to be in self-isolation and uh, you're putting people at risk by having a parade of people walking through a unit. So yeah. try to not do that. Great, yeah, great, great. Yeah, we, we've had that question before. My tenant is in the property. I want to show the property. I see this on, on Facebook, realtor posts, that kind of thing. Tenant is refusing to allow showings in the property wise. Um, they're ending their tenancy. What do I do? It, there's not much you can do. Uh, you can't force the tenant to show the property and everything like that. It's an absolute mess of a situation. Um, so 24 hours you, notice no longer applies for tenant showings. No, you can't, you can't, yeah, you can't exert your right going up 24 hours access to unit wise. You have appraisers. Appraisers aren't even going into units right now if it's occupied. So to answer how do I then rent it out, floor plans, pictures, there are people that will rent sight unseen property wise. So that's where you got to equip yourself with the right, with the right marketing material to show that to prospective tenants. Right. Uh, so Jay Michael asks, uh, if they use their last month deposit to cover this month's rent, when do I issue an, an N4? Well, it depends whether you agreed to allow them to use it or not. If you allow them to use it and it's in writing, then you don't have that opportunity to issue an N4 unless uh, come May 1, they go into arrears. Um, If you didn't agree to it, they're in arrears already and you can issue an N4 now. Great. Vivek asks, is it a good time to buy an investment property? Oh yeah. Uh, any any uh, any questions about real estate investing and advice wise, um, reach out to us directly. Wise, you can reach out to Kyle at Kyle at Remaxwealth.com. That's Kyle at Remaxwealth.com, and uh, we can schedule a, a call with you uh, to discuss those. But uh, the answer is yes. Actually, it's a great time. But there's more details into that. So Amy asks, uh, she has a condo downtown that does not allow Airbnbs or any of those companies. Do you see that as making it more valuable to potential buyers or investors? Uh, I can tell you there, the majority of buildings downtown do not allow Airbnb. I can, I can count the buildings in my hand that actually allow Airbnb. So it's actually the majority of buildings do not allow Airbnb downtown. So someone else asks, um, essentially our mortgages haven't put on, been put on pause. Um, do you right. think there's going to be any programs or any changes from the government coming soon? Have you heard about anything, Alex or Elaine? I have no, not. But, but you, can, you can reach out directly to your bank wise to see if you're eligible for that. So they do a case by case um, to see if they will allow you to defer the mortgage. So it's, it, it is case by case wise. So Elaine, Minaz asks about joint leases, so multiple people living together. Would you be able to share a few words of wisdom in general about that, about how to approach those scenarios? I'm not sure I understand the question. It sounds like that might be a rooming house um, where you have a building with five bedrooms and each tenant has um, their own unit, their own bedroom that they rent and they have common uh, a common area, kitchen, living room, shared space. Um, you know, sp- is there any advice on that? It, well, I have lots of advice on that. The first thing I'm going to tell you, and I'm not going to go into any other point, but this point is if that is your situation where you're renting out different bedrooms to people, make sure that each bedroom has a, a unit number on the door. Because if one of those tenants doesn't pay and you need to call the sheriff in after you get an order from the board, if it isn't delineated as unit one, two, three, or ABC, the sheriff will not enforce. 
and I'll, I'll give a different question because I've had this question. Uh, two bedroom condo, um, one person in living in one room, the other person living in the other room. Uh, the, both their names on the lease, one person still works, the other person has lost their job. Um, they're still both liable for that, for that full monthly rental amount. So if that's the question wise, if it's specifically more of a condo with two people living in, they'd still be both responsible for the, the rental amount. And I'll, yeah, oh, it's good. And I'll, I'll give one further example wise. Two people living in a unit, only one name on the lease. Um, then that one person, even though it's two people in there, that one person's responsible, whether that person has given them rent money or not. Great. Um, so someone is a landlord turning over their property this week, but their tenant hasn't given them proof of insurance. Should they turn over the unit to the tenant? No. Is it in their lease that they have to provide insurance? Okay, well, but I'm not. It's, it's not that simple, but if it's not in, in the, I mean, if it's in the lease agreement, um, and they haven't done it, then, you know, that, I don't, I hesitate to just say no in the way that Alex says, because there's ramifications to having paid first and lost, accepted a unit, accepted and, and accepted the tenant and then not give them the keys. So um, I would want more information before I answer that question. So I'll give it up how we deal with it and Elaine may not like it. Uh, but uh, we, we, we would require, we require proof of all utility hookups and uh, uh, um, content insurance prior to releasing uh, keys to a property. Once. We won't release keys without, without that. All right. And I'll, I'll let everyone know uh, for the, for the, we, we deal with condos downtown and everything like that. Um, and if I'm, if I'm, if I have a, a pre-construction condo and I want the builder to release keys to me. They won't release keys to me unless um, I provided them with uh, $2 million liability insurance. It's the liability insurance that's the, the biggest thing that that's required. So uh, am I in a gray area? It seems that I am, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, if, if you push them, you will get the insurance. It's not, it is so easy to get this insurance. It's, it's the most easiest thing in the world. So just push them is what I would say. Great. So Stevie had a comment that the landlord board advised that it is illegal to use last month's rent. Elaine, can you comment? Uh, well, illegal is, is maybe not what they said. Traditionally, the last month's rent deposit is to be used um, for the last month that the tenant is in the unit. That is traditionally what last month's rent deposit means. Um, it is not illegal to say to a tenant, you can use the last month's rent deposit, but you will no longer have a deposit. Um, I, I, you know, it's not You're, recommended behavior yeah. under normal circumstances. And in the normal in the normal course, if I have a landlord that comes to me and says, well, the tenant owes me April's rent because they used the last month's rent in March, my answer would be no, they owe you two months rent. Correct. That's yes. in the normal course, but we're in extraordinary times. The other thing I just want to say about that is the landlord and tenant board, I mean, ultimately if you end up at the board at, at, on these files, they have a wide berth in terms of what they can order and not order. And they, they're going to want to see landlords who have tried to accommodate tenants under COVID-19. Um, and they can order payment plans. They can um, say, okay, you know, I know you landlord, you want all of your rent right now. Well, that's not happening. The tenant says they need five months and we're going to give them five months to pay that rent. Right. Great. Um, so the next question is, uh, what's the best way to defer rent for tenants on a month to month basis? They've been there for over a year now. Does it, does time period matter, Elaine? Yeah, for me it does because if it's a new tenant, I'm not as inclined to defer. If it's a tenant who's been there for a year or longer, there's never been an issue. I'm, you know, it's like credit, right? I'm much more willing to, um, work with somebody who has been really a star tenant up to this moment in time. 
So the best way to defer it is in writing always because you want no confusion down the line about when that rent payment is due or what your agreement is. And Elaine, are there any standard forms for deferral of rent agreement? No. Great. So Ben asks, after the COVID-19 is over, if the current rent is below the market value, can you incre increase more than the government allowance? No, uh, there is an exception. If it's a unit that was built after November of 2018, you could, um, but that's pretty rare. So, so, so what, what, I, what I would say to people, and uh, Nat, I see Nat in, in the Zoom webinar chat uh, posted this, so I'll kind of address this. So now I have a unit that's coming up for rent-wise. What are different strategies that I can take? Well, obviously, if you're in a rent-controlled unit, and right now, rents are decreasing because supply is greater than demand wise. So if I'm renting a unit today, I'm renting it for less than I rented it in uh, 2019. But if the fundamentals maintain, then in 2021, my, my rent should go back up to 2019 levels or potentially exceeded, depending, we don't know what happens, right? But if I rent it in 2020 um, and I, I take, 1900 versus 2100 um i don't have the ability to to increase that beyond the the government prescribed rates what can i do to protect myself well what you could do is instead of renting it for 19 you can rent it for 21 but then provide a month rent of free so what you've done is you've locked into the 21 price point but by amortizing the free month they got in that, let's say $1,900 level wise, my math's not gonna be exactly in the dividing wise, but what you do is you, you, can offer, you can offer a free month instead of reducing that ticker, uh, that sticker price on the unit so that in 2021, you can then do your increases based on 2100 versus 19. So it'd take a long time to get that $200, um, make up that $200 spread. So to anyone answering that question, how do I get my unit rented out, but not by not compromising my future cash flow on the unit, you can offer up free rent in today's environment to protect yourself. Um, and also not that would help you incentivize people to, to come and rent out your unit. Now, if I'm a building built after November, 2018 or November, 2018 on, there's a specific date, date just drop your rent because you're not a rent controlled unit. So drop your rent, you can rent it out for 1900, then with 90 days notice in 2021 up to the end of the lease term when the tenant's about to go month to month, you can increase it to whatever you want. Your market will bear what you'll actually get, uh, get, get for it. Um, so those are your two different scenarios wise. And um, what I'll actually send out my, my best tips to get a unit rented during COVID-19. I think I'll do send it out this week in a separate email um, for the people that have, have, uh, have been attending over the last four weeks to get that message out there to people wise. Because what it's been over this last month, April 1st wise, it takes 21 days to start a new habit. Um, that's the general guideline wise. So, you know, since we started this at the beginning of April to where we are now, it's exactly 21 days. So we have a much better understanding what the new normal is, what we didn't know what governments are going to do. For example, BC was giving landlords directly $500 help subsidize rent. That never came in Ontario, probably may not come, right? We have a great, much better understanding of how we're dealing with these situations than when we started these. So um, I, I can send that more out with confidence wise, what I would do to market my rental property during COVID-19. So I'll send that out to everyone in a separate email wise, probably sometime this week. <clears throat> Great, thanks Alex. So Amy from Buffalo, hey Amy, um, says that she has a tenant who's given her 60 days notice and they're moving elsewhere, but she's saying they can't leave to cross provinces right now. Is that true? They can, I, they can cross provinces, I think. What was the question again, Kyle, say it again. Um, essentially she has a tenant that gave their 60 days notice, but they're moving elsewhere, but they can't leave to cross provinces. Is that right? Uh, sounds like a bullshit meter, sounds like a bullshit. There was some border crossings between Ontario and Quebec. They were screening people. Um, yeah. Only limitations I've heard of. Yeah, the, the, unless they're going to none of it. I think none of it's the only one that actually closed the border wise. Everywhere else, I think they're fine. And they can still get moving vans and do everything that they need to to vacate a property, correct, Alex? 
Yes, 100% moving is still allowed, everything and, like and, that. And if you ever get an opportunity to go to Nunavut, um, I spent uh, two weeks in Iqaluit, and it's an extraordinary place. So just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, something like that's come I, up many times before is commercial versus residential leases. Can you comment? Totally different animal. And we, um, it's, not, it's not within my scope of practice to be dealing with uh, or advising in any way on commercial leases. Um, I would say that uh, Doug Levitt, who is the lawyer that I'm referring people to on the short term stuff, he also knows his commercial stuff very well, and you can go to him on that, and you'll be getting his contact information at the end of this. Great. So Laura asks, uh, she has a tenant that hasn't paid for six months with no excuse. Is there somewhere she can report them to warn other landlords or to affect their credit score? Um, well, you know, she needs to be moving as quickly as possible on an N4. Um, I don't know why it is that she has left this so long. Um, yeah, I, I say reach out to Elaine. <laughs> Great. Um, so Elaine, you had talked about owner occupied units. Does this apply when direct family members are moving into a unit as well? So the rules around owner occupied units, um, you can only do that. You can only serve the N12 if it's at the end of the term and that people just sort of are in mid lease think, oh, it's a good opportunity. Um, the rule basically is that a family member and it's very specific, it's a child um, or a, a parent of the owner of the unit may move into that unit uh, they have to promise to, they have to swear an oath that they are going to live there for 365 days. They also have to pay compensation to the tenant. And these are the ones that are the most abused of all. We get units where people, we've got 20 year tenants and all of a sudden that and are way under market in terms of rent. And we get a family member moving in and they show up for two weeks and then they leave, those folks are getting huge, 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 huge fines. Especially if you do something like that in the middle of COVID-19. Right. Gary had a question. Are there any stats around landlords and the percentages who are forgiving rent versus deferring rent? No. No. Okay. Um, Gary asks, uh, from a legal standpoint, there was a difference between reducing the rent and collecting the rent and paying back a cash rebate or offering one month free. Can you talk about the legal differences there? Um, if you do a rent reduction, and so let's, again, $1,000, now you're only, you're reducing the rent to $800. Once that rent has been $800, um, I'm laughing at myself because my numbers are from 25 years ago. Um, my my uh, it, once you reduce that to $800 a month, that becomes the main that becomes the the threshold. So when you're increasing it down the line, it's based on that $800. So that's where the danger is. Um, you can certainly do rent rebates to um, tenants. I, I'm nervous about um, people who think that they can say, okay, the rent is $2,000 a month, but if you pay it on time, then it's only $1,000 a month. If that's what you've been doing for a period of 12 months, the, the rent is $1,000 a month, not $2,000. Right. Um, so Stevie had asked around property taxes and is the city still deducting property tax or do we have to contact them to defer it while this COVID situation is ongoing? I don't know. I would assume that the city is going to want their taxes. I, I, I would say per, personally wise, I, I pay. I don't have an automatic withdrawal for my account wise. So um, I would say reach out to the city. If you, if you have automatic withdrawal, the city is still going to take the money. You would, I, I, you would have to ask them for a pause. Here's the thing about that. In, in terms of any of your bills, if you're in a position to pay your bills, pay your bills. Otherwise, you're going to be eventually meeting up with my brother, the bankruptcy trustee, and my other brother, the bankruptcy lawyer. If you can pay your bills, um, the, you the, pay, pay the, your bills. The, the pages work, work in such happy fields. <laughs> we do. I can, I, can, I can only imagine what, uh, what, what, what it's like during the holidays. 
<laughs> so, so what what you don't know about me, Alex, is I'm also a clergy and I marry people. So I, I get a, a nice balance. Okay, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so Edgar and Ash have very similar questions. Where can you evict a tenant if you want to sell the property? No. No, never, really never evict- could, never could. Yeah, so let's just be clear about this because it's good information generally. In term, you, can, you can evict a tenant at, at the end of the term if the purchaser, if you have a signed agreement of purchase and sale and the purchaser requires a premises for their own use. And then there's all sorts of other subsections to that. So you have to be able to qualify. But a lot of times you get people who want to put the property up for sale and they want it, a vacant property on the market. And no, we can't do that. Great. Anita asks about the N4 form. So if there's multiple tenants and landlord names, there's only one signature area for landlords. Do the landlords all just sign that same area? No, the one landlord signs on behalf of all the other landlords. Great question though. I give that a dot I cross T. And uh, Kyle, can we we wrap this up uh, probably in the next like by 1230 or? Yeah. Um, Alex, while I'm asking the questions, maybe if you wanted to scan to see if there were any that you thought were particularly interesting. Um, So is the tenant obliged to provide their landlord their new contact information if it changes? Uh, Yes. I mean, I can't evict someone for it, but yes. And Ash asks, what are typical costs around third-party management, say around paralegal services or property management? So my just... Yeah, Sorry, you want to tell yours and I'll tell mine? Out. Yeah, you, you tell yours, I'll tell mine. So for paralegals, it really depends on what we're doing for the tenant. So there is no, so there's no straight answer to that. Um, an arrears application, for example, would be one price over a, uh, a, 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 a situation where the tenant has got farm animals in the living room, which has happened. So, you know, it's a case by case situation. Alex? Yeah, uh, we're we're one nineteen per month plus HST for our property management. I'm just looking at. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So, um, Oksana, if you're under rent control, there's nothing you can do to catch up to uh, market rents. Unfortunately, always a great question. Um, but no, there's not there. Even if the market's above what, uh, your current rental amount is and you're subject to rent control, there's nothing you can do other than increase it by the prescribed amount. Um, yeah, I'm just scanning questions. All, a lot of them are duplicates. Yeah, I'll give my tenants one year lease is ending, uh, next month and they want to continue living there automatically goes to month to month. You don't need to write another lease. And I would actually say, don't write another lease. You, you're once, once, once your one year lease is done, there is no reason for you to write another lease. You're best off just continuing month to month. It gives you the flexibility um, and doesn't lock you in towards the future wise. Uh, I, I wouldn't sign a, another one year lease. Never recommend it. I agree. Do Erlaine in the situation where someone's not able to pay their bills, but they're willing to vacate the unit. Yeah, um, if, if they if they are willing to vacate, and you can get them to sign an N nine, uh, and get your unit back, it's it's. I mean, we don't like to see vacant units, but the truth is that if um, I was trying to evict somebody on non payment at this point, I might not be able to do that until September, October, November. So um, you're better to get the unit back and try and re rent it and cut your losses. Uh, Alex, did you see any other questions? I don't even know what a PA is. It illegal to ask for PC, PD, oh, post data checks. What do you think of e transfer rent? Uh, we actually don't even use checks. Uh, we do all electronic transfer of our rental amounts on the property management side. Um, you know, Elaine, I, I know there's kind of a gray area in regards to post data checks. Is it illegal to ask no, for post data checks? It, it's, it's not a gray area, it's actually quite clear. Okay. You can ask for post-dated checks, but you cannot make uh, it a condition of the tenancy. In other words, I'm not giving you this unit unless you give me post-dated checks. You can't do that. I could say to you, I want post-dated checks, and you could say to me, I'm not giving them, and that's perfectly fine. 
Great. Uh, so Lane, Sally Chan asks, if the rent increase was communicated pre-COVID and the tenant is walking back from that, or even if you wanted to cancel it, what's the best way to go about that if you no longer wanted to increase the rent as a landlord? Uh, Sally, um, hi Sally. Um, you can uh, you can deal with me on that separately, but I would be writing to the tenant on on that, saying we're not we're not moving forward on the rent increase. It's pretty simple. Okay, I, I, I do want to address this question. Um, uh, you can help me on time. I'm a new tenant. Will, okay, Ten, tenant set. What what is the this is a general wise what is a, a recourse for tenants that don't leave so the tenants said they're leaving at the end of the month but now they're like no I can't leave so it depends on how they gave you notice um, and this is we bump into this all the time um, notices of termination whether they're given by the tenant or by the landlord needs to be in compliance with the um, form set out at the landlord and tenant board. So if you just have an email that says, hey, I'm going at the end of the month, that's not good enough. Um, if you've got it on the correct form, there is an application available and I would recommend getting it into the board. Um, now the board is not in this moment going to order termination, but it gets you in queue for when the board is up and running again. And, and what I would say is, I, I, I noticed that question for the one specific person in there, if you're having trouble, reach out to Elaine is, is, is what I would do because sometimes just really Elaine talking to the person is where the bullshit meter comes in, uh, can really help move the person along. Okay, I, I think for the most part, we, we've done a great job answering the questions wise. Um, we will do another one of these again next week. Um, and you know, what, you know what I'll say, I'll add this on just in case, uh, if you want to email your questions, uh, you can email your questions out to us. We never actually asked that before. Why don't you, e you can email your questions out to us and uh, we can have them addressed it in the, the, the next topic because that way we can, we can consolidate the questions that are all kind of the same wise and into one. So there is an option to email your questions as well. Um, and add on, Alex, we're going to have a recording of this session. Yeah. Um, we'll distribute it via email to everyone that signed up for it. And we'll also be posting it on our website at remaxwealth.com for everyone that also include everyone's contact information as well. That's also available in the chat now for anyone that wants to grab it. Yeah. So if you, and, and again, the recording is going to go out. If you don't get it today, you'll definitely get it tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. Hey, th Elaine, thank you so much, Kyle. Thanks so much for moderating wise. And if you have anything specific related to the real estate market, reach out to Kyle at remaxwealth.com. Uh, and uh, we look forward to speaking with all you all again. Talk soon, guys. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.